you know, we have a, a very uh, good speaker coming up, sort of Thomas Bonk. I will now then sort of stop talking and then let you enjoy his uh, his his wonderful presentation. And yes, indeed, in fact, uh, we uh, Thomas uh, de uh, deserves a uh, a long introduction. He's um, um, he's from Krakow in Poland, and uh, he speaks of several languages, including German, sort of English, as you'll hear, uh, Spanish, and Portuguese, and he's also um, an expert in uh, the impact of bilingualism on brain functions and um, also but that, that's just one of, of his uh, skills he's also um, a, um, a tour guide as well a multilingual sort of tour guide uh, and also um, works on the design of um, cognitive and uh, motor assessments to sort of to difference of languages you know and cultures yes but uh, I guess if I was to give him a full introduction, we'd be here for a quarter of an hour. So I'll hand over to Thomas for, um, for his talk. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, well, thank you very much for the well, kind introduction and above all for the invitation and congratulations to a wonderful idea. So when I heard about this meeting, I thought that's fantastic. That's what, you know, I've been fighting for for many years, if not decades. So I am definitely very happy to come and contribute. Then ironically as it happened uh, yesterday morning i was guiding in portuguese in edinburgh therefore i could come only uh, only later uh, yesterday and so i realized that my talk is supposed to say at this kind of connection between the two parts of the meeting so i thought i will try try to take it seriously and do something at like bridging it so those of you coming from social sciences probably know that there is now a kind of tendency to write something like a positionality statement. So the idea is to try to explain where you come from, why you do research in the way you do, and so on, so on. I had to do it about, you know, for an article about native speaker that I wrote uh, you know, a while ago with, with colleagues, with Jean-Marc Develle and... Uh, and um, uh, 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 well, you see that early morning for me is a is a time of uh, memory problems. I'm rather a late raiser, so it's an unusually early uh, early talk for me. Uh, but uh, speaking uh, so positionality statement is something which, in a way, should express your own position so that's why this talk is quite different from all talks that i that i have given before namely i am now trying to kind of combine my own personal history how i came to certain questions how i see things and so on and so on so obviously i want to start uh, with uh, my roots so this is the place, as already was mentioned, where I, uh, where I come from originally, Krakow in Poland. And, uh, well, I would say, not that I am biased in any way, one of the most beautiful places in the world. I very much encourage you to visit it. But here are the two places where my parents came from. So on the left, we see Lwów in Polish or Lviv in Ukrainian uh, now, where my father was from, and on the right, Zabrze, or when my mother was born, it was called Hindenburg in Silesia. And they, in some way, express two very different attitudes to languages, and particularly to German language. So my father's family was a polish family polish-speaking family but with the roots going back to galicia so krakow lvov and so on and so on where german language was the lingua franca between all the national groups speaking completely different languages so basically if you have a pole a czech a hungarian a romanian a german speaker a croat they would speak german because that was so to say the common language like English would be nowadays. So my grandfather studied in Vienna because you went to the capital of the empire to study. Uh, so from this point of view, uh, my father spoke fluent German and there was not necessarily something ideological connected with the language, it was the lingua franca. Whereas my mother came from Silesia where you had a long history of incredible linguistic 
tension and conflict. So she told me when she was growing up, it was a German city, and in, uh, in the time of Third Reich, when she went to school, the slogan over the school door was, the Polish spricht is unser Feind. Whoever speaks Polish is our enemy. As you can imagine, after 45, it went exactly in the other extreme. So I have family members who told me when they were children, when they were kind of caught speaking German on the street, they were warned, you know, if, if we catch you next time, that will be reported to police and so on and so on. So from this point of view, I could see, well, of course, now I reflect on it back, but I would say already from a child point of view, I realized that language can be something quite neutral and language can be something very ideological. And when my grandmother died, I remember the question was how to spell, which orthography to spell her name, Olesz, with SZ, Polish spelling, or SC, SCH, which is the German spelling, so that it doesn't really offend any of the language communities. And that's, by the way, why Latin was very popular, because that was a language which was beyond Polish and German, so you didn't have a problem. So, as I say, looking back, I think that made me already quite interested in language. But what is also very important is that in the time I was growing up, there was a very strong bias, prejudice uh, against bilingualism. So my parents, who were both doctors, my mother even a pediatrician, asked, you know, the specialists, psychologists, speech and language therapists, you know, we could speak, my father speak German as well, we could use German as a language at home. And she was told, no, 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 it's really, it will confuse the child, you will end up schizophrenic, you shouldn't do it. So basically, I ended up growing up only in Polish, but for instance, my mother was uh, singing me uh, German songs because she didn't know the Polish one. So I had a kind of repair, passive repertoire of dozens of songs in German, which I knew by heart. But secondly, also my parents were, when they started having an argument, they were always switching to German. So uh, that was in some way a very motivating experience because I realized that knowing languages can give you access to some knowledge that people try to hide from you. So from this point of view, I would say maybe for this, I should be grateful to my parents because that left me with a, uh, with a uh, you know, lifelong passion for learning languages and kind of discovering what was between it. Uh, also looking back, it made me aware of the difference between uh, let's say pragmatics and semantics, namely when the conversation got very, very heated. I remember that, you know, my parents were speaking at each other, Sei doch ruhig! And I always thought this might mean some, some terribly awful, offensive term. It means be calm. But of course, you don't tell anybody to be calm unless there is already a tension in the room. So I think for me, that's a kind of really nice example, be the difference between semantics, which is be calm, and pragmatics is we are having an argument. Okay, so what were the languages of my childhood? So as I say, from my family, I knew about German. And uh, as I say, I was exposed to it through two very, very different contexts, singing and quarreling. So a certain ambiguity between the sweet and the aggressive came out. And then you know, I realized when my family from West Germany came, then of course they would be German speakers. And I remember a visit of my cousin where uh, I was very ambitious to show her. It is said that Krakow has about 200 churches. So I was dragging her through the churches. And then I remember at the train station when she was going back, I told her, and don't worry, when you come next time, I show you the other 100 churches. She never came back again. So maybe that was not such a good idea, but that shows that already then I was also interested in guiding. So certain topics appeared very early in my life. And as I told you, there was a generally negative attitude against bilingualism, raising children bilingually. But at the same time, languages were very well recognized as an important part of the school education. So uh, we had to learn Russian, the language of the empire, uh, and, and English. There were, of course, again, a big political and ideological differences. So in English, you are learning like, would you like to live in New York? Or how to buy a ticket uh, to go from London to Rome or whatever. In Russian, you are learning about the life of 
young Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, the Russian revolutionary, or about the harvest in Kolchios and the you know this kind of you know state-run uh, cooperatives. So not necessarily topics that you know young people would be very very fascinated by. But I was lucky to have had always very very good Russian teachers who tried to do as little as possible of this kind of official ideology and as much as possible of literature, poetry, and so on, which Russian is incredibly rich in. So from this point of view, again, it was a kind of certain certain ambiguity. There was an ambiguity with English as well. So on one hand, it was you know, this great language. But I have to say there is practically no subject in my whole school education uh, with which I was struggling so much as English. And when my when I did my A levels later in Germany, my English teacher told me, you know what, I give you a good advice for life. Try to look for a job where you don't need English. And here I am. But I will come at the very end. In some way, I have found now a job where I don't need English, namely guiding in different languages. Then Latin and Greek. Well, traditionally, so this was the school I went to, very, very traditional. So when we went, I will show you in a moment a picture of the, we had a kind of copy of the, uh, on the ceiling of the uh, famous Raphael picture, the School of Athens, where basically you, you see Aristotle and Plato and so on. There was, you know, Greek language was everywhere written. So of course, I was curious to find out what were the figures. And Latin, Latin was very unpopular with the communists because firstly, it was of course kind of the bourgeois language and the language of the church. So definitely something a no-no. So at some point, we are allowed to have a voluntary lessons of Latin. As you can imagine, everybody wanted to go there because learning Latin was a protest against the communist government. So from this point of view, yes, Latin can be a protest language. And then, of course, I was always very interested in traveling. And that, you know, so first the kind of the local languages of the neighboring countries. So apart from Russian at school, Czech, Hungarian, Romanian, Slovak, Bulgarian, I find absolutely fascinating that, you know, we have so many different languages. And then uh, also on a kind of slightly longer travels, Italian, Greek, Turkish, and so on. And in fact, I love the idea of linguistic diversity. I remember one of the things, particularly if you live in a country where you cannot get out so easily, we're kind of listening to the radio and listening to different radio stations and just trying to identify, oh, which language is it, where is it coming from? And in a way, even if we didn't understand it, this kind of different melody of different languages was a pleasure in itself. And then I was speaking about my school, so some of you might recognize this guy, uh, uh, Joseph Konrad or Josef Konrad Korzeniowski, uh, who wrote, I would say, relatively okay literature. I mean, he ended up in the canon of, of English school literature in what was probably his fifth language. And he went to the same school as me. So that was the aula where we had kind of pictures from, you know, of different people. So in a way, I was aware already as a child, you know, one of the alumni of our school, uh, Josef Konrad, who was Polish speaker originally, but he grew up in Kiev. So he spoke Russian, probably Ukrainian as well, then German, because that was he did French, because we were on the French boat. So then came only English. So it was fifth or sixth language. So in a way, you can, you can reach a certain level of proficiency even in your fifth or sixth language. That was something which was kind of clearly, clearly there. So if I put this together, kind of the first of the four reflections that I have, reflection on childhood and school, this is, by the way, the picture of the School of Athens, which I said is, that firstly, I was very much aware, I didn't formulate it like now, but in a way, intuitively, it was clear to me that language and politics can be very, very closely related. Secondly, that in a way, languages is an object of curiosity. So diversity was a value in itself, as I gave an example from this kind of radio listening. And it was clear that languages are key to other worlds, past and present. And in education, it was part of the educational canon. And this is, again, not only in Europe. In Europe, basically, until relatively recently, you were supposed to learn usually at least two languages. So it was the classical time, so to say, Latin and Greek. But let's say 19th century, probably you would want to know German and French. And uh, that was, so to say, what my grandfather would have learned as a kind of Western languages. But this is not only a Western part. So for instance, if you look at the Islamic world, 
We have, of course, Arabic as a language of religion, of the code, and so on. But then most poetry was written in Persian. And then a lot of people spoke, in fact, a Turkic language as the first language. So an idea of using at least three languages for three different things in life has been something which has been there for, for many cultures across the world. And uh, one thing, I mean, of course, I didn't know at that time when I was a child about the citation of Goethe and of uh, Vygotsky, but I would like to kind of uh, stress it because it expresses what I was probably thinking about. So one is, there is a famous citation of Goethe, the fremde Sprachen nicht kennt, weiß nichts von seiner eigen. He who doesn't speak other languages doesn't understand his own. And this was cited by this beautiful, in this beautiful book by, by uh, Vygotsky. And what I find important is, they are, so to say for me, three important things coming together. First, the languages are an enrichment. That was clear for me as a child already. The more languages, the better. It's great that you know, we have language diversity. There was no question that it's something positive. They also allow you to understand your own language better, so you have insight. But then the last point, in some way, there is something liberating. And that's why I have here this beautiful citation of, uh, of Vygotsky, who basically write that learning a language, uh, and he, I mean, he uses asfabash diet, which means liberate, the uh, the uh, child's uh, mind at pliena konkretnych jazykowych form. So basically, it's a liberation from the burden, from the yoke of concreteness. And I would say that was for me very clear. It's kind of it's liberating. It takes you somewhere else. I will come to it later because not everybody feels like this, as you might already suspect. Okay, so let's now move to. My university education was 17, I moved to uh, Germany, so I had to do A-levels already in a new language. And then I studied first in Homburg Saar, then in Essen, then in Hamburg. And it was always an occasion to learn, so to say, the neighboring languages. So when I was in Homburg, I started learning French. I always found French fascinating, but French was not very easy to learn in Polish schools. You always had, you always had a choice between German and, and English. Uh, then in Essen, I did, you know, my, my approach to Dutch and then in Hamburg to Scandinavian languages, Norwegian and Danish. Uh, then I did electives in Ankara, where I which I would say a relatively decent level of communication ability in Turkish. And in Maebashi, Japanese, I would say, was much slower uh, progress. But there were very interesting observations. So I remember when I was working in a hospital in Japan, I was in general medicine, and then I still remember in written down in the uh, notes of the patient, abdomen ni druckschmerz, which is a wonderful blend of three languages. So abdomen is the Latin word for, for the stomach, for the belly. Ni is the Japanese locative, so in, and druckschmerz is a German term, basically, that, you know, you get pain when you get touched, so to say, there. So abdomen ni druckschmerz. I said, that's, that's fantastic how they blend these languages. So you have basically Latin, Japanese, and, and German in one single sentence. And then I was doing quite a lot of extracurricular courses, which kind of be, will become uh, relevant later. History, philosophy, but also psychology. I ended up now in psychology department and sociology. So here are pictures from Ankara and and Maebashi, and here Hamburg and Hamburg Czar in Germany where I studied. And then very very important part time for me my doctorate in Freiburg in Breisgau in Germany, where my supervisor was Klaus Wallesch, and the whole work was highly interdisciplinary. So that's where I learned working with linguists, with psychologists, and so on together in this rather beautiful, rather beautiful place in the Black Forest on the border to Switzerland and France. And my work was on acute aphasia, so basically language disorders called, uh, caused by different brain diseases, mainly but not exclusively stroke. And we are looking at first three weeks after lesion and then how it developed further. And the question was, can we encounter the same syndromes as in chronic aphasia? So what we learn about aphasia is usually built on patients who had this picture, linky picture for a very, very long time. Uh, now, the predominant approach at that time were so-called 
box and arrows models. Here's an example of that. So you had, so here is this function, and this function, this is connected, and so on and so on. And in a way, it was a very productive method because it allowed people to look at dissociation between different brain functions. So it became clear that there is no kind of one language, one brain, but they are kind of these different parts. But it had its problems as well, which became clear already by then. There was a kind of very modular vision of brain and language. That's why I have as a metaphor, my daughter here put it very neatly, her things, you know, into a, a cupboard. In fact, when we were in a, in a hotel in Poland. And the person who was very, very influential was Jerry Fodor, with his famous book, Modularity of Mind, and the idea of informationally encapsulated modules. So language was supposed not to interact with anything else. It was a module in itself. The whole way of thinking was now, I would say, deterministic, static, operating with limited resources. And as I say, it had its advantages in terms of describing dissociations, but it had its disadvantages in terms of a difficulty of explaining any change in clinical picture. Why do people recover? Is suddenly this module kind of switch on again? So that's why you had the rise of compensation theories, which were looking at functional reorganization of the brain. And that was the topic of my, of my PhD at that time. But it was also difficult to accommodate multilingualism there because basically, do we have every you know, one language module for all languages, or do we have separate language modules for separate languages? It didn't really fit very nicely into this picture. So if I reflect now at the time of my university education, I would say the very positive thing is interdisciplinarity. And in fact, one of my friends, Martin Haspermat, a, a renowned linguist, described me on one occasion as linguist of the Zweiten Bildungsweg. So Zweite Bildungsweg is was very traditional German. So basically people who kind of were not very well at school and then went to work and then suddenly they realized, well, maybe, or slowly they realize, maybe I want to go to university and so on. They are then allowed to go to evening classes to get their A-level and then they st can start going to university. So in a way, so to say, well, I did my medicine, but you know, I saw the light and in my evening courses, I tried to put, so to say, uh, to get up to date with linguistics. So I was reading a lot of books, articles and so on. I went to linguistic conferences, summer schools and so on and so on. So I looked for any occasion I had to get exposed not only to languages, but also to linguistic theories and so on. Uh, then I think what I learned in Freiburg was to interpret individual findings in the context of broader theories. Of course, it was not cl so clear to me then as it is now from the perspective of time, this kind of development of modularity to networks, but it was clear that in a way the big picture interacts with the individual findings and makes, in fact, the findings interesting. So, uh, so it prepared me for, I would say, kind of things in a broader picture. And it was the beginning of link linking of language to cognition because, of course, doubts came up how encapsulated language is. But at that time, it was not really very specific. And particularly, cognition was separated from sociolinguistic and ideological context. So what I told in the beginning, I definitely didn't rise there. So being in Freiburg, this is a book which I read in that time. Of course, being in Freiburg, you have to read Martin Heidegger, the philosopher from there, Unterwegs zu Sprache, on the way to language. And this is the house, Fachschaft, the house of the university in, you know, near, on Schauinsland, near Freiburg, where in fact Heidegger already had seminars with his students and one I had seminars as well. But in a way, it was for me a different world. So I was doing it because I was interested, but I never saw that it can in some way combine with my work. Then I spent one and a half years in Bern in Switzerland, working in psychiatry. And the very first patient I had was from Somalia. And he spoke, uh, you know, he spoke Somali, uh, he spoke uh, quite a good Amharic because he spent some time as a refugee in Ethiopia and Arabic because then he went, he went to Sudan, but no German, no English. So difficult uh, communication. And the question was, he felt persecuted. Was it real because there was a, a civil war in, in Somalia and this fight was kind of also happening in Switzerland or was, was he paranoid in terms of schizophrenia? 
And then I remember we got a translator from Zurich, a woman of incredible intelligence and ability to observe. But at the same time, I mean, she had, you know, only basic education because she was a refugee. But I mean, for me, I kind of, I immediately thought, my God, in a different situation, she would be a university professor. I mean, so she was so brilliant. And then she translated everything that he said to us and said, but can I tell you my observation? And I said, yes. He produces a kind of funny words in our language. You know, they could be words, but they don't really exist. And gave some examples. And that was exactly what was described by classical psychiatrists as neologisms, except that this woman certainly was not reading, you know, Bloiler and the classics of, of psychiatry. So then I was quite sure that this must be schizophrenia. In fact, he improved dramatically under medication. But it was also an interesting thing how far you can get, even with little formal education, if you are bright but also very observant and look so to say at your environment i mean this woman really stayed in my in my memory so this topic came to me back so to say in edinburgh with, with the question thought disorder or language disorder i mean there is a bit of debate schizophasia so this kind of language in schizophrenia whether it's a linguistic or a or a kind of general thinking disorder and i even got a paper in with colleagues from psychiatry in 2012 on that so, so the topics come back, as you can see. But then very, very formative time for me was Cambridge. I mean, here, uh, uh, John Hodges and Karen Patterson, who were my kind of immediate heads of the research group, then psychiatrist Herman Berrios, the directors of the institute that was working, Alan Badley and William Marston Wilson, um, Rob, uh, I mean, uh, here, Ian Robertson and, uh, and Friedman Pulvermüller. I just mentioned them because anybody in the field will probably recognize the names. I always said I felt a little bit like being in Renaissance Florence of cognitive neuropsychology. I mean, you had practically all those people at the small place where you interact, you know, walking through the garden, having tea and, and discussing things. So that was the MRC, Medical Research Council Cognition Brain Sciences Unit. And the question was, I moved a little bit from stroke to neurodegeneration, so this is like Alzheimer, like Parkinson's and so on, and seeing them not only as diseases, but also as possible windows into the human mind. So the new challenges was relationship between dementia and aphasia and between cognition and movement. So here you can see that now this kind of encapsulated border of language is definitely breaking down and my own research was among others about non-verb dissociation that in some diseases patients have more problems with verbs in others with nouns and how it relates to dissociation between processing of abstract objects and actions so is it something more semantic about the semantic of action and object or is it something more syntactic about nouns and verbs and i was working with diseases where people have motor problems motor neuron disease parkinsonian syndromes and so on and so on and that was in this broader context of a shift from thinking about modules to thinking about networks and from connect, uh, meaning that people got interest in connection between movement and cognition. Terms like motor cognition, I mean, designed by Jean Nero in, in 2006, became popular and embodied cognition or in theory of embodiment and so on and so on. So the reflection on Cambridge was here finally there was an integration of language, cognitive and motor functions, but within the individual. So there will be something coming still in Edinburgh. And it was the most international and multilingual place I ever lived in. So, you know, I was trying to learn whatever was around me, Czech and Hungarian. I was president of the Central European Society, so I was organizing these courses myself. So, of course, I went to them. Then Spanish and Portuguese, great occasion to practice. Even for one term, we had Basque. And then also Sanskrit, Chinese and Arabic. So that started getting me interested also in non-European cultures. And intense travels to South America, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, but then also to India where I worked a lot with Indian colleagues whom I met first in Cambridge. And, but the point was there was no thematic connection between these worlds. So again, I have this kind of international flair, but my work is very much the body of one language, one, and so to say within individuals. So here comes the kind of the last stage at Edinburgh where I moved 2006, so it's almost 17 years. And here I was based in PPLS, which is School of Philosophy, Psychology and Language Sciences, and of course with connections to bilingual matters. Uh, then 
I was very much linked to Edinburgh, neuroscience, informatics, and so on. So this picture, for instance, is discussing something with a colleague from informatics, where we came up with an idea of language production model, and so on, and so on. So it was very interdisciplinary. But what was possibly even more important is now this kind of global dimension comes out even more. So for eight years, 2010 till 18, I was president of World Federation of Neurology, research on aphasia, dementia, and cognitive disorders and organizing teaching courses in Iran, India, China, Mongolia, Cuba, Ecuador, and Colombia. Our main meetings were in Turkey, India, and Hong Kong, and then doing myself research in India, later Singapore, Uganda, Malta, and so on and so on. And then important personal dimension, it comes the birth of my daughter 10 years ago, and that of course kindled my interest in language development. I mean, till then I was very much, you know, I would say young person was for me anybody under 50. And then suddenly I had, you know, this child acquiring languages. Now, I mentioned already this kind of change in the theoretical frameworks from Freiburg to Latin Cambridge to, to Edinburgh. And here I want to give you an example. And I like this particularly because it comes from the same researcher, David Green, who in 1998 developed the first kind of very influential psychological model of bilingualism. And if you look on the left side, it looks very much like still this box and arrows models from the 80s. Can you recognize it? And here the same person revising his model 2013. And that's something which I like really about, about David Green. I mean, there are some scientists who kind of once say it and then spend the rest of their life defending what they have said because they must be right because they said it. Whereas I am particularly fond of scientists who are really looking for or searching for what is the best model in the time and revise their own model. And, and David Green is a great example of that. So you can see an increasing role of linguistic environment. So suddenly it's the language use which is decisive. But if language use is decisive for cognition, then we have to study language use because otherwise we will not know about cognition. So it's a big departure from this kind of Chomsky models where you have the competence which is developed during the first few years of your life. And then basically the rest of life is just, you know, more or less the same, nothing, nothing more happens. Here is exactly the opposite. It changes all the time. And that means that cognition needs to be combined with sociolinguistics. And in a way, I mean, the kind of in the COVID time, I have to say during the lockdown time, I spent quite a lot of time reading sociolinguistics. And I thought, wow, I should have done it like, you know, 30 years ago, because suddenly it makes so much sense to interpret things in terms of this kind of usage based approach, than in terms of this very deterministic, simplistic, static model, you know, first few years, then the door closes, and then basically nothing else happens in your life. Uh, so that was my equivalent of lockdown travels. In the time where I couldn't travel to different countries, I could travel to different areas of science. And for me, I would say sociolinguistic was the discovery. That was my big journey of the lockdown time. So in this light now, I start seeing and interpreting things very differently. So here's, for instance, one of the classical work very often cited as an example of the kind of prejudices that were brought against bilingualism uh, in earlier times uh, from Sir, who was writing about Welsh English bilinguals. And they, he thought that they have lack of definiteness in the meaning. Confusion is carried over from the brain area connected with language to those with other functions. Now, he was not a neuroscientist. It was simply assumed. So all the things he speaks about brain is because it seems to me like this. And then there's even a kind of psychoanalytic moment that there is an emotional conflict between cathartic play and reality principle. And in English speakers, it's fine because it can be reconciled. In Welsh, there is a kind of schizophrenia because their, you know, their id is Welsh, their super ego is English, and it cannot kind of be reconciled through the ego. But if you read other things in the same article, you realize that this is all about politics and political imposition. So he says the use of native language in a subject state, 
I don't think that modern Wales would like to be seen as a subject state, but that's a different topic, tends to weaken in favor of the language of the governing state. Yet a people will not readily abandon their language and adopt another. Obviously, they should. Under British rule, there are many people who speak other tongues, and consciously or unconsciously, the English language is coming gradually to prevail in the subject states of Britain, the natives during this process passing through various stages of bilingualism. So bilingualism is basically a middle stage. There are basically three stages. The lowest stage of human being is to speak a language which is not English. Awful, absolutely awful, shouldn't happen. Then you have a slightly higher stage where you still speak this bad language, but you already speak English. So that's already better, but you still have this kind of contamination of non-English. And then the highest state is, of course, to be a English-speaking monolingual, because then you don't have the contaminations. So here you can see how, on the one hand, the arguments pretend to be about the brain, but it has nothing to do with brain. It has everything to do with politics. And, you know, I was kind of surprised. Why didn't I realize that earlier? But sometimes, you know, you need a little bit of time to arrive at, at insights. And not by chance, the big revolution in our understanding of bilingualism came from Canada as a country where bilingualism has been a very, very important part of national identity. So it was so sweet. I don't know, some of you might remember it. Twitter used to have 140 letters, characters now it says 280. And I remember that one of my Canadian colleagues had this wonderful tweet with a new one, where say, there is only one way in which a proper Canadian will use this extra word. Il y a seulement une manière. So basically, we had the same message written in English and in French. So now we can have, you know, 140 per language. So, of course, many of you will know this crucial work was done by Lambert and Peel in Montreal in 1962. And that was the time what the Quebecois called La Révolution Tranquille the quiet revolution, which basically changed till then. They were simply the underdogs. And then suddenly, the motto was, Maître chez nous, we want to be masters in our own house. Maintenant or jamais, now or never. And what they found was that bilingual children, if anything, outperform monolinguals once you correct for the social status. That was the problem of the cell studies. He was looking at the kind of urban, posh English kids versus rural kids speaking Welsh. Surprise, surprise. So basically what he was describing was the socioeconomic difference, but dressed as a language difference. Here they looked at you know, ma matching it, and then it was very, very different. And then the kind of leading group became later Ellen Bialystok at, group at the uh, York University, and describing, uh, firstly, I mean, she is developmental psychologist, so first work was about children, starting you know, with Lambert and Peel, and that they will be better in metalinguistic skills, social cognition, executive functions. I will come to those three points in my next slide. And 2004, it was extended also to older people. And then, as I will show in a moment, 2007, into patients with dementia. So this, why I do those three things? And here again, there is a connection between the personal and the, and the official. So exposure to different languages causes metalinguistic knowledge. Here we have already, you know, what, what Vygotsky nicely said in both spoken and written language. And they are very nice. And I mean, there are so many examples I can think, for instance, observing my daughter. So one time she was going to karate and then she said, Daddy, how do you say karate in Polish? I think it's karat. I said, well, no, it's also karate because it's a Japanese word. And she said, well, but tell me a word, a Scottish word that is different in Spanish and Polish. So not like haggis because she knows that haggis is haggis in every language. And I said, well, Edinburgh is Edinburgh in Spanish and Edinburgh in Polish. And she looks at you see? So basically, she was trying already to find the rule. So I take away the last consonant, the last vowel, and then I get from the Spanish from the Polish rule. In this case, it was correct, but the rule itself was not so bad. So from this point of view, I think, Kids, I mean, the idea that you know, kids learn only implicitly. I think my experience is from very early stage, kids develop theories, and sometimes they even express them. And they will look for, because, you know, particularly my, my daughter likes, you know, when she, uh, when she can 
get me to the end. So another beautiful example with Chinese was, she asked me, uh, you know, we're speaking about duck, and she asked, you know, how is duck in different languages? Duck is very important for children. How is duck in Chinese? Now, I was lucky because one of my favorite dishes is Beijing, Kao Ya. So I knew that it's Ya. I even knew the right tone. Great. A few days later, she asked me, Daddy, how is computer in Chinese? I knew it was something with Dien, like electricity, but I was not sure. Was it Nao Dien or uh, Mao Dien and so on. So I told her, yeah, something with Dien, Mao Dien. So she's a mm, bit suspicious. And then a few days later, she asked me, Daddy, how do you say rainbow in Chinese? And I had no clue. And then she looked at me and said, Daddy, you don't speak Chinese. And it was kind of, it was like a mixture of sadness that, you know, suddenly, you know, the Omniscient, that is not omniscient, but also a feeling of victory. Now I got him. <laughs> so to say, it's a really moving, you know, from high to low frequency in a very systematic way that, you know, would be absolutely fine in a psycholinguistic experiment. So from this point of view, one of the things I think I learned from my daughter is children are theory builders. In a way, we have it. Our brain is a sense making machine and we try to make sense of what we see. So the idea that they just kind of get it implicitly and don't reflect and so on, I, I think is not particularly correct. And that's why exposure alone, if they are curious, and kids are curious unless you really take it out of them, is enough. Then language switching, mixing context and so on. Theory of mind. When I said to my daughter, uh, uh, Oh, boli mi głowa. I have headache. She would run to mommy and say, mommy, mommy, Dali has sore head. And when I said, me duele la cabeza, she would not translate because mommy is Spanish, mommy knows Spanish. So kids find very, very quickly who speaks what, how well, and so on and so on. And from this, it's very, very short step only to realize that, you know, people might have different theory of mind, different knowledge and so on. But all of this would not work if you wouldn't have a mechanism to select your output. So that's why here I have Alba with a friend Olivia with whom she could share three languages because Olivia's mother is Polish and father is Spanish. So she could bring any word and Olivia would understand. Here is she playing with Tiatmar uh, and a, a lovely, lovely boy with a three languages, but it's English, Dutch and French. So here they need to look for English because the other languages are not shared. So very quickly you realize when you are multilingual, what is the spectrum you can use with whom? And then you still have to control it. And this is the famous executive function effect. Of course, as everything, it has its price. So the lexical access tends to be slower in bilinguals. And you can even see it when people learn language that it gets slower in the first language. I would say it's not surprising if you have a lot of books, it takes you more time to find a book than if you have only one. So from this point of view, I think it's a price worth paying. Now, I mentioned that 2007, this uh, study came uh, out about dementia. So again, the same uh, group, the uh, uh, group I was mentioning. And that showed that bilinguals developed dementia four years later. And this fitted into some work earlier and much work over uh, following time and the results were interpreted in the light of cognitive reserve so that this kind of language switching control and so on is a constant uh, exercise for the brain and that started a whole list of work so i want to go a bit faster i will put by the way i had my twitter i have in the first and i will have in my last slide so usually after talks i put links to papers and so on on twitter because then it's very easy to uh, very easy to access them uh, so uh, together with suvarna aladi whom i knew already from cambridge uh, we did a series of studies in hyderabad which is a place in india which has been multilingual for hundreds of years and so it's not a kind of question of immigration like you can have in Canadian, American, or your, some UK studies. And uh, basically, we found very, very similar results with four hour years delay. And in fact, in illiterates, because the other argument was those people go to better schools. So here we have people who never went to school. They cannot read and write. They learn the languages on the street. 
And here, the effect is even bigger, six years. So basically, it's not just an effect of school. And we managed to show it also in stroke patients. So in a way, here we have what I would call converging evidence from two diseases. Because if this cognitive redress hypothesis is correct, it will delay the onset of dementia, but it will also accelerate the recovery after stroke. And that is exactly what we found. So here you can see normal cognition in uh, practically um, less than 20% monolinguals, more than 40% bilinguals, so quite, quite impressive differences. And that led me to other studies in, uh, in Came, uh, Edinburgh, Lothian Burst cohort, where basically people, children were tested in Scotland for their intelligence when they were 11. So we can look whether it is something called reverse causality. So maybe simply cleverer people are more likely to learn languages. But if you compare intelligence 11 and 70 or 70s, you find that those who learn another language perform better then you would predict only on the basis of the childhood intelligence. So we know that it is not just reverse causality, it is an additional effect. But here politics comes again. And here I want to show that, you know, there are people who feel differently about languages. So here you have from a British uh, newspaper, doctors give pupils sick notes to duck French and German lessons, and it fears the stress of learning a second language is harming their mental health. So you couldn't be more far away from Vygotsky's idea of liberation. Here, it's a burden makes you break. You get mad because you have to learn foreign languages. What a cruel, you know, treatment of children. And after this paper appeared, uh, I got a, a letter was published commenting on it. Of course, it's nice to have a second language, but I don't believe the science twaddle for one second. The human brain can only contain a finite amount of information, and as English speakers, we are fortunate not to need a secondary language. That space is much better utilized for science, history, and our rich culture, because, of course, other cultures are not rich at all. And, you know, this intellectual comment comes from Daily Mail. However, and I was thinking about it, you know, listening to your talk yesterday, this citation comes from the former leader of Singapore. We have only two gigabytes of memory in our brain. That was an argument that you used. OK, so we have to learn English. So maybe one gigabyte for English, one for Mandarin, but no other Chinese languages because that's, there is no space for that. So in a way, this argument of a kind of limited space in the brain has been used. And now you remember what I told you about the chest of drawers. So in a way, here it comes again, the idea that, you know, brain is like, like a chest of drawers. And if you put your socks there, there's no place for t-shirts or vice versa. Now, the point is, fortunately, neuroscience has moved since then. So what that describes is limited resources models with chest of drawers analogy, strict static localization competition for space. But what we have nowadays are added value models, which are interactive, dynamic localization, neuroplasticity, and learning and adaptation. If you have a network, if you add another layer into a network, it makes the network better and more stable. So in a way, you have exactly an opposite paradigm. Learning other languages stabilizes your knowledge rather than pushes it away. But you know, this kind of primitive chest of drawers model is still very, very prevalent. So that's why you have this prejudice of multilingual confusion that, you know, we know that all languages are activated simultaneously. There's a lot of evidence and the cost is slower Mexico, uh, lexical access, but the increased challenge is exactly the mechanism of training of control and monitoring. And if that is the case, then learning languages should bring better uh, cognitive function. And that's exactly what other studies of us showed. So if you follow people through learning languages or compare first and fourth language year language students with other students, you find improvement in attention functions. So again, we have the kind of, uh, and those processes are running throughout the lifetime. So basically, even after retirement, there are big changes in language in language use. And based on that, in Glasgow, a new company was founded, Lingo Flamingo, a social enterprise. 
which is offering language classes to healthy elderly and to patients with dementia. And they found that apart from any cognitive effects, it also counteracts feeling of loneliness and self-esteem and boosts people confident. There is no confusion. So I would say confusion is something which monolinguals have. I sometimes say that there is a metaphor. You see, the point is, imagine that you see everything only in black and white. And then someone tells you, but you know, there are colors in the world. Your reaction would be awful. You must get confused. It's not all black and white. No, and I really like the colors, but that must be awful life. I would not go into it. So basically, I think it's the idea of confusion is basically for me a marker of a monolingual way of thinking. So I'm coming to the end. My last reflection on the last time in Edinburgh. Well, here finally, I managed to integrate cognitive and sociolinguistic perspectives. So in a way, I see it as a kind of things come together finally. Well, it took a long time. Then I'm definitely practicing multilingualism. Firstly, in everyday life, I speak Spanish with my daughter, for instance. When I have PhD students, other languages, I try to use them. I have a lot of German, so we make an effort to speak German. And then, as was mentioned, I'm working also as a tourist guide in English, Polish, German, Spanish, and Portuguese. And it's fascinating because it's a, and my ambition is to add a new language every two, uh, two years. So in a way, you know, keep my mind, uh, keep my mind uh, you know, fresh. And I try following, conducting, and communicating research in different languages. So from this point of view, I would say it's clearly both. And there is an interaction between personal experience and research. Let me just give last example before my final slide. And this is a very recent one. I was in Israel uh, on a conference in Tel Aviv about two weeks ago. And then on the last day, I went to a museum of Jewish people, which was just around the corner from the conference room. And I went, I usually like to go at least twice to museums, so first round to see what's where, and then kind of to see things more uh, in detail. So I knew the museum, and then a couple, elderly couple came up to me and asked something in Hebrew. And then I automatically answered, sorry, I don't understand Hebrew. But by the time I finished this sentence, I realized that I understood because they were asked, asking about Beit Knesset. Beit Knesset means synagogue. Well, it can also mean parliament, but in this case, it was clear. And there's this beautiful exhibition of synagogue. So then, as soon as I say that, I don't understand. I say, no, no, but I did understand. So you're looking for the synagogue exhibition. It's there. And for me, it's an example. One of the problems is speed. We need longer speed. And I think that's exactly what you said yesterday as well. And in fact, there is a new study in plus biology suggesting that scientists with non-English native language need more time to read papers, to write papers, and so on. And, but they see it only from the perspective of, well, if we are losing time, it's not just. But the point is, there is another perspective. So I think it's not just that you know it's unjust, because the slower processing can mean also more profundity. We reflect more. So in a way, sometimes slowing down is not always a bad thing. I mean, you know, Daniel Kahneman, his ideas of quick and slow thinking, the slow thinking is the rational one. So in a way, and again, there's a lot of research suggesting that we make different decisions, not necessarily worse decisions, if we do it in a language which is not our native tongue. So from this point of view, for me, it's not so much a question of, a question of uh, justice. It's a question of losing enormous amount of information, knowledge, understanding, and so on, if we confine ourselves to, a, to one language. So here's a paper where we, which we wrote about different uh, non-representativity of aphasia literature. And here an example that it matters, you get a very different picture in aphasic patients, whether they speak Bengali or English, exactly the opposite. So they will use, in one case, more, in the other, less pronouns. And then a kind of beautiful book I can recommend by Anna Wierzbicka, Imprisoned in English, I mean, showing systematically this. So I would like to finish saying that I think, you know, firstly, we should do science in different languages, but we should also try to communicate it. So that's definitely what I try to do very much. Here are some links to other talks and so on uh, of mine. And since a lot of people listening to this talk will probably have learned in other language, we have a nice survey on language learning. QR code and the link, we would be very happy. And as I say, I usually put after talks within the next few days or so, some information links to papers. So if you follow me on Twitter, then you will get those information practically live. So well, thank you very much indeed. And I am very, very curious about your questions. <laughs>